lesson this afternoon is entitled Rejoice in the Lord. It's from Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 4, where Paul the Apostle writes, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, Rejoice. As we look at this, we understand that this is written in the background of persecution. Paul has been exhorting them and continuing to exhort them to stand fast and faithful under the persecution that you are facing along with other Christians during that time. So we realize that we understand that. However, I want to look at some reasons that we have for rejoicing today regardless of what comes to us in life. For instance, we should rejoice because God has given us our physical life. We should rejoice because God has given us mercy and grace so that we're saved from our past sins. We should rejoice because God has given us, given us our families and our homes and our lands, the things that we enjoy from day to day. But we rejoice also for the promise of heaven and because of suffering even. We can rejoice in our suffering. But we also rejoice for the Father's watch, care, and protection over us. And so as we think about this, we have many reasons to rejoice. Let's consider some of these things. First of all, and by the way, this is just touching the hem of the garment. Uh, there's no way that in the time I have that I can even begin to touch all that we have to rejoice over. But I do want to think upon some of these things. And, you can think upon perhaps other things that, that can be added to this as well. First of all, because God has given us our physical life. In Genesis 2, verse 7 we read, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Who did it? God did it. What did he do? He formed man from the dust of the earth. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God gave us a physical life that we enjoy. It began with Adam. It was continued through Adam and Eve. And we have it today as a result of our, of our parents, our very first parents upon this earth. But also we read in Acts 17, verses 25 through 26, Neither is God worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life. What do we read here? He giveth to all life. Every living thing... Upon this earth owes its origin to God, not to an explosion, not to some, some other reasons, aliens from outer space coming in or anything like that. Life originated with the supreme being. It originated with God. The fact is that life cannot come from non-life. It has to come from life. There's no such thing as spontaneous generation. And the hypothesis of evolution flies in the face of the fact that spontaneous generation has been disproved over and over and over again. In Acts 17, verse 28, just a few verses down, Paul's still there at Athens, and he's preaching to those folks there. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. Now that's true in many ways. Number one, it's true in the sense that we as Christians live in Jesus Christ, but it's also true that all the whole world is... is because of Jesus Christ, and, and he makes it possible for us to continue our, in our lives, whether it be a Christian or not a Christian. In him we live and move. And not only that, but it was through him that all things were made and all things continue. And so in him we live and we move and we have our being. Certain of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We should rejoice because of our physical life and because God gave it to us. What a wonderful blessing we have. Also, we should rejoice because God has given us mercy and grace so that we're saved from our past sins. This is a great blessing indeed. God's mercy is so important. That's God's part. I'm not discussing our part in, in, in our salvation now because we have a part in that as well. But we wouldn't have that if it hadn't have been for God's mercy. There'd be no salvation without God's love, His mercy, His grace. We read in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You say it not only took His mercy, but what did His mercy bring about? It brought about the crucifixion of Christ, which makes our life 
possible, which makes our hope real, you see. The re hope of the resurrection because of Christ's resurrection. And it was our begettal, our new birth is because of God's mercy toward us. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, we read, God who is rich in mercy for his great love, for with he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with him, with Christ, by grace you are saved. Notice, when we were dead in sins, he made us alive unto Christ. Now he did that through the crucifixion of Christ, through his love, through his, his grace as well. It wasn't just mercy that was involved here. But without God's mercy, it would not have been possible. He had mercy upon us. He's, he's, not given, he's made it possible for us not to receive the punishment that we deserve for our sins through the death of Jesus Christ. He's quickened us, made us alive in him because of his mercy. Titus 3, verse 5 says, Not of works of righteousness which we have done, as what the Jews tried to do, be saved by their own righteousness. Romans 10, verses 1 through 4. We're not saved by righteous works which we devise or which we might come up with our own righteousness. We're saved by doing the righteousness of God, as it were, obeying his, his plan of righteousness. And then we read, not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so we learn how important God's mercy is. Without God's mercy, we cannot be saved. We have no hope for salvation. But along with his mercy, we find his grace. Grace is, is uh, giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. In other words, he gave us salvation even when we don't deserve it. He gave us Christ on the cross even when we don't deserve it. And so he gave us this plan of salvation, even when we don't deserve it. We read in Ephesians 2, verse 5, Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Without God's grace we wouldn't be saved, just as we couldn't be saved without his mercy, without his love. Ephesians 2, verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. That tells us it's not grace alone, but but. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Salvation is a gift of God. It's given to us by God's grace through faith. And we read in verse 10, we're created, we are his workmanship, created to do good works in Christ Jesus. And so all of these things go together. We can't eliminate one. We can't say it's grace alone, faith alone, or works alone. But all of them fit together. But the thing I'm trying to emphasize right now and trying to get through is that we should be thankful we should rejoice because of God's grace, because it's by that grace that we're saved. In Titus 2, verses 11 and 12, we read, For the grace of God hath bringeth salvation, hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What does that grace do? Well, number one, it teaches, doesn't it? It's not something that's inactive. It's not something that's just a feeling. It teaches us. What does it teach? It teaches us how to live as Christians so that we can enter into heaven, living soberly, godly, the way that he says here in this present world. Why? So that we can reach heaven, so that we can enter into heaven. So grace teaches us what we need to do to reach heaven. It's that simple. Grace is not grace alone. Grace appears to man in the form of Jesus. It appears to man in the form of his word. It appears to man in the form of, of making it possible for us to be saved. Titus 3, verse 7. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Justified by his grace reminds me of Romans 5, verse 1, which says we're justified by faith. But it's not faith alone. It's not grace alone. But here's the thing. We are justified by his grace. And I can give thanks and I can rejoice because of God's mercy and because of God's grace. I believe that's well summed up even though it's not mentioned in this passage. But I believe this passage really brings it home about these things. That's Romans 5, verses 5 through 10. I want to begin reading in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's all mankind. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Now listen. 
But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, why were we enemies? Because we rebelled against him, we sinned. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When we were yet without strength, we could not save ourselves. No way we could save ourselves. We can work our fingers to the bone. We can be as good a people as we can possibly be, but we could not save ourselves because sin would separate us from God. When we were yet without strength to save ourselves, Christ died for us. Well, that's the summation of just about God's grace and mercy and love right there, isn't it? Tells us a lot about it. God giving us this thing. Why? So that we can be saved. We can also rejoice because of the many blessings that we have from our God. There are blessings from God that are shed on both the godly and the ungodly. Jesus, after teaching that we should love our enemies and bless them that curse us and do good to them that hate us, stated in Matthew 5, verse 45, that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust. Yes, he, he gives blessings even to the unjust. Don't the unjust enjoy their homes? They have homes, don't they? Unjust enjoy food? Certainly they enjoy food. They take pleasure in food, just as you and I can take pleasure in good food that the Lord's blessed us with. Unjust receives clothing and shelter, things that are needed, things that can be enjoyed. They enjoy their families. They, they rejoice whenever a child's born into their family. They rejoice whenever their child achieves great things, don't they? This happens with the unjust as well, doesn't it? The joy of a loving spouse is a joy even to the unjust. People who are in the world enjoy those who love them and appreciate those who love them. The joys of children and many other pleasures that people rejoice in, blessings that God has made possible for all mankind, both the just and the unjust. However, there are some blessings that are bestowed only upon his children. Spiritual, home, families, lands, etc. Mark 10, verses 29 through 30 speak of these. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. Now listen. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands, pers with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Think about the blessings here. Oh, you may have to give up someone you love as far as being close to them. You may have to separate yourself from them because of a withdrawal. But look what you gain. You gain these things that, that, that you have to give up in life. You gain these things in Christ. These spiritual blessings is what he's talking about. Not temporal, but spiritual that you have here. Notice this, though. There's just one thing that doesn't seem to be a blessing, but he includes it, doesn't he? And that is persecutions. You receive these things with persecutions. Something else here that's a spiritual blessing that is not found among those who are in the world as they continue in that. And that is forgiveness. In Acts 10 verse 43, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now, we talked about grace not being grace only. We talked about being mercy and not mercy only. Here we must also add it's not a faith only, must we? But nevertheless, Remission of sins is granted to those who believe. And this carries with it the idea of being all-inclusive, of serving the Lord, doing what he said to do, and our obedience to him. In Ephesians 4, verse 32, we read, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Here's the thing. If God can forgive me for the things that I've done in rebellion to him, and the things that I might have said or thought that were so wrong and so terrible, can I forgive someone else who's hurt me? I better be able to. If I can't, well then I will not measure up. Colossians 2 verse 13 says, 
And you being dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How you may live with Jesus, how you may live with God, is through the forgiveness of your sins. And that's what God grants you here. Forgiveness. What a wonderful blessing. Have you ever seen somebody who really cared about somebody else? They had hurt them in some way, and yet that person, whenever they, whenever they came and asked forgiveness, that person would not give it? I've heard, I don't know how many people say, I forgive you, and then add this qualification, which is telling me that they're not really forgiving. I forgive you, but I'm not forgetting. They're just saying, I'm not really forgiving you. Now, we've talked about forgiveness, so we understand we don't li literally for put that blanket out of our minds. We understand that. But we mean we don't hold it against them anymore. And for me to say, I forgive you, but I'm not forgetting, is the same as saying, I forgive you, but I'm not forgiving you. Friends, we have to be a people who recognize forgiveness for what it is because it's a wonderful blessing. And the person who asks forgiveness and doesn't receive it is often hurt and saddened, sometimes far more than the one who's originally offended. In 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9, and I only want to notice verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a wonderful blessing we have here that he's willing and ready to forgive us of all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, there's that little word if that, that Rick was talking about in Bible class. There's a condition attached here. And here in this case, it's confess our sins. In other words, we have to repent and confess. Revelation 1 verse 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I am so thankful for forgiveness. I'm thankful for my parents' forgiveness when I did wrong. I'm thankful for friends' forgiveness whenever I offended them. I'm thankful for the forgiveness of others that I may have, for, have offended. It would hurt me deeply and greatly to think that my parents who loved me so much, I'd offended them to the point they couldn't forgive me. Or some friend that I was close to all my life, I'd hurt them so much that they couldn't forgive me or wouldn't forgive me. Friends, forgiveness is a great blessing. If you've ever desired it from someone who wouldn't give it to you, you can understand how great a blessing this is. And it's given by God to us, and we have rebelled against Him. We've denied Him in our actions, in our lives, in some way, at some point, when we sinned against Him. What a wonderful blessing it is. And we should rejoice in the forgiveness that God gives us. But also another blessing is the fact that we're part of a family. In 1 John 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Makes him our father. We're his children. What manner of love that we should be called not servants, not slaves, not just subjects. We are his children. That's why in Romans, the 8th chapter, you read that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're going to have the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to enjoy that inheritance. It consists of eternal life. It consists of all the blessings of heaven reserved for us there. We are the children of God. Ephesians 2, verse 9. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners speaking to Gentiles, the fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. But that's just as true of us who were at one time separate from God. Now we're part of a household. We're part of a family. Family means many things. A family means love. A family means somebody that you can rely on to support you and to help you during times of trouble and times of need. A family is where you find support whenever you're, you're in trouble, whenever you're in pain, whenever you're suffering in some way. Families are so vital and so very important. Oh, what a blessing to be a part of a heavenly family. Blessing to be a part of God's family. Galatians 6, verse 10 says, 
He's writing good, do the good to all men, especially those who are the household of faith. The household of faith, God's household. Ephesians 3.15, a speaker of God, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You've heard people speak, say, this, this is a good family. I've said it I don't know how many times about people that I thought so highly of. They were faithful Christians, did what was right, lived the right way and everything. So that's a good family. You can depend on them. They're good people. But friend, if you're a member of God's household, you're a member of the best family that's ever been upon the face of the earth. You're there with Stephen who died for the cause of Christ. You're there with Paul, Peter. You're there with other greats from the gospel. You're part of a great family, a wonderful family. What a wonderful blessing that is. It's the best of families, God's family. Also, we need to rejoice and should rejoice because we're in the kingdom. The kingdom was prophesied of, longed for, and looked for by the Jewish people. In Genesis 49, verse 10, the prophecy was, A scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh came. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Number one, the scepter indicates a king. And so the scepter, the kingship, shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come, the one whose peace shall come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Jesus Christ gathers people from all the nations of the earth. He is a great gatherer, as it were, pulling people together in the one kingdom to serve him and to worship God. In Psalms 2, verses 6 through 7, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill Zion. I will declare the decree, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son this day. Have I begotten thee? Psalms 89, 3 and 4, I have sworn to David my servant, Thy seed will I establish forever and build up his throne to all generations. Prophecy of the kingdom. Psalms 89, <laughs> And I can't read this all because of the time factor that would be involved. But verses 19 through 36 is the entirety of the context. But I only want to read verses 26 through 29. Here we read. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, <coughs> higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne is the days of heaven. What a wonderful prophecy of Christ and the kingdom that's coming. In Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7, and I'm only going to notice verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom to order it. Is it any wonder these people were looking for the kingdom? And then not only that, but John the Baptist in Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2, prophesied, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was a prophecy, just as sure as the Old Testament prophecies were. The kingdom's coming, it's near. So this would encourage those people to be looking for the kingdom. Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Matthew 4, verse 17. And we see that anxiety, that, that longing for, in the words of the apostles in Acts 1, verse 6, when they asked Jesus, Wilt thou this time restore the kingdom unto Israel? That was what they were looking for, longing for. They wanted a king. But the problem was, for so many of them, they wanted an earthly king not a heavenly king. We are a part of a kingdom that's not of this world, but one that's of heaven. And that promise of the kingdom has been fulfilled. Colossians 1.13, we've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. And friends, we should rejoice because of the blessing of having the best life that's possible. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, Solomon concludes his great experiment with these words. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is a whole word duties in italics, as I mentioned this morning, meaning it was added by the translators. This is the whole of man. This is where man finds fulfillment. This is where man finds completeness. Where? In serving the Lord. 
1 Peter 3, verses 10 through 11 says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to Christians. And by doing these things, they're living the way God wants them to live. And it brings about the best life that a person could ever have. If you want to live long and have good days, do these things, he's saying. These are the things Christians do. And so we see that we should rejoice because as a Christian we have the best life that can be had upon this earth and eternal life waiting for us in heaven. But now here's a strange blessing and cause for rejoicing. And I have to admit, when I've had to suffer, though my suffering has been small compared to those in the Word of God, I've never been thrown into a den of lions. I've never been thrown into a fiery furnace. I've never been taken out like Stephen and stoned or faced the trials that Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians 11. We've all who tried to live for Christ have had various areas of suffering. And whenever we're suffering, it's hard to rejoice in that suffering, isn't it? Very hard to rejoice. All kinds of emotions take over. But there is a place for rejoicing in our suffering for Christ. In 1 Peter 4, verses 15 through 16, If any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. What? If you suffer because you're a Christian, if you're mocked, if you're persecuted, if you're put in jail because you're a Christian, rejoice. That just sounds like the opposite of what most, people, most of us would probably do. I think if I was thrown in prison... I'd have a hard time rejoicing. <laughs> I think I'd be crying and say, I want out of here. <laughs> but if it's for the cause of Christ, then it's worth it. And we have to remember, I'm no better than my Lord and Savior. And he suffered the cross. If I was thrown in prison for being a Christian, then I should rejoice because I'm suffering as my Lord and Savior suffered. In Matthew 5 verses 10 through 12 Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven now listen for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you blessed are you when you're persecuted why because the faithful have undergone this. It's a sign that you're among the faithful if you're persecuted for the cause of Christ. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, All who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul wrote concerning the persecution of him and the other apostles in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 9, and he writes, Persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. What an attitude. What an attitude. That's the same attitude we see in those of the first century who were courageous enough, even if they weren't apostles, even if they weren't prophets, to face the fiery trials that they had to face, to face the persecution and death and imprisonments that they had to face. The question is, how would you or I do it? Would we face our persecution with rejoicing because we're suffering as Christ suffered? If our friends turn against us, would we rejoice if they turn against us because we're Christians? If, if our family rejects us because we're serving the Lord, will we still be able to rejoice as Christians? If we were put in prison or suffering mock at work, whatever, would we still be able to rejoice because we're Christians? Friends, from the lightest persecutions, even to death itself, we have cause for rejoicing under persecution because we're suffering as the apostles, as the prophets, even as our Lord and Savior suffered during his life and in his death. We should also rejoice because our names are written in heaven. This, I didn't get to talk about the book of life. I've got a little time. I'll talk about the book of life a little bit. In Malachi 3, verse 16, 
Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him, for they that feared the Lord and thought upon his name or spake upon his name. In Exodus 32, verses 32 through 33, Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, Moses says, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book of which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. What book are they talking about in Malachi? What book is he talking about in Exodus? Why, it's the book of life. In Psalm 69, verse 28, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. There's a book of life, and the righteous are written therein, and those that sin are blotted out. Philippians 4, verse 3, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with the other my fellow laborers, whose names are written in the book of life. There's a book. It's written before God. And in it, our names are written if we're faithful unto Him, if we serve Him, if we obey Him, if we worship Him, if we follow Him. That book's there. In Hebrews 12, verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. The book where our names are written in heaven. In Revelation 3, Verse 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. There's the promise. Endure the persecution. Stay faithful, and your name will remain in the book of life. Revelation 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. That'd be the books people lived under. Old Testament for the Old Testament folks, the New Testament for the New Testament folks, and another book was open, which is the book of life. Three books are mentioned here. Well, books, we're not told how many. Two, old and new, though. And then we have the book of life, don't we? And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Friend, if my name's in the book of life, it's because of my works. That doesn't mean works that I can boast of. doesn't mean works of the law or my trying to just keep the rituals that God has given me, but rather an obedience out of sincerity and love for my Lord and a desire to please Him. If I do those things He's commanded, then I have the assurance my name is in that book. If my name's in that book, I'll be in heaven with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And oh, what a wonderful place that will be. If you could just take a moment and think of your happiest time and the most beautiful scenery you've ever seen in your life, know this, that it doesn't hold a candle, not even a match, to the beauty and the wonder and the joy that's in heaven far surpasses anything that God has given us here upon this earth. As I said, we can only touch and just barely touch the hem of the garment concerning why we should rejoice. We rejoice because God has given us our physical life. We can rejoice because God has given us mercy and grace so that we're saved from our past sins. We can rejoice because of the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ, our spiritual homes, our spiritual families, our lands, so on and so forth that we enjoy as Christians. We can rejoice because of the promise of a home in heaven and because of suffering even. And we can rejoice because of the Father's watch, care, and protection. If you're a Christian, you have the best and you have the happiest life possible. There's no other life that compares to it. If you're not a Christian, your life has blessings, but not the most important blessings of all, those spiritual blessings that are found in our Lord and Savior. And the most important forgiveness of sins and the promise of a home in heaven. Well, someone says, okay, you've got my interest. I want these blessings. 
Well, what do you have to do to have this blessing? Well, you need to be a Christian. That involves hearing God's word. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, Jesus, Jesus there says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. What is the point? The point is, is that you have to hear. He said the person who hears and does these things well, there's people who hear and don't do these things, and he deals with that, and that house collapses, doesn't it? Next of all, you must believe. In Galatians 3, verses 26 through 27, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You're children of God. How would you become children of God? Well, first of all, by your faith. There's more involved in that. But he says you're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So you have to believe. To become a Christian, you have to c continue in your belief to remain a Christian. And then you have to repent. Acts 2, verse 38. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why do I need to repent, Peter? You need to repent for the forgiveness of your sins. Without repentance, you can't have forgiveness of sins. The word repent means change your mind. Change your mind should bring about a change of direction. So you need to repent, change your mind about the way you've been living, about the things you've been doing, and give yourself to the Lord. Not only that, but you must confess, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's made unto salvation? Confession. What confession? Same confession that the Ethiopian eunuch made in Acts the 8th chapter, verse 37, when he asked Philip, what, must, uh, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest, thou mayest. The Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Do we make that very same confession? Matter of fact, it's a good confession that Peter made. Back in Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, isn't it? And then we, be, we must be baptized. 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. Now I'm only going to notice verse 21. The like figure for unto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism doth also now save us. Baptism alone? No. Couldn't save us without grace, mercy, and love from God. Couldn't save us without our faith, our repentance, or our confession. But baptism is the dividing point. It's the dividing point between still being in sin and having those sins forgiven. Because the scripture says, Baptism doth also now save us. Let me ask you a question. You can go to just about any religious body in this community or in your community, wherever you may be, if you're watching over the Internet. And you can ask, is baptism necessary for salvation? Does baptism save? And that denominational preacher, 90 times out of 100, will tell you no. Baptism does not have anything to do with your salvation. You can be saved without it. But the Bible says, Baptism doth also now save us. Not baptism alone. But if the Bible says baptism saves us, you better believe the Bible. Not some preacher. If you want to be saved. And then after baptism... Your sins are washed away. You're a new creature. You've experienced the new birth or taken part of the new birth, perhaps I should say. And then in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, we see that we must continue faithfully because Paul himself wrote, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself shall be a castaway. What's he say? He's saying I have to keep on keeping on. I can't stray to this side or that side. I can't fall back. I have to keep on going. Because I can become a castaway. Friend, you and I have to keep on going. We can't quit the race. 
We must complete the race. Someday we'll face the Lord in the judgments we talked about this morning. And we'll have to give an answer. There's a song in our song book that asks this question, what will your answer be? We better be ready to give the right answer. I want my answer to be, I've lived for thee, O oh Lord. I've served you. I want to be with you forever and ever. And I want to hear those words from him enter again to the joys of the Lord. I want to be in heaven where there's no death, no separation, no dying anymore. Do you? If so, won't you answer the gospel call? Won't you answer Jesus Christ now while together we stand and while we sing?